Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. lives in God, and God lives in him. What a wonderful thing is our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. That's a pretty good shot, did you think? <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> if you're wondering what I'm laughing at, I started coughing because I had too strong a cough drop in my mouth. And uh, so my good guard here gave me a whole box of Kleenex. So I, I took it out and threw it at him. I didn't throw it at him. I threw it to him. That is a difference, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. I know that's over, but it's never over. You know, the season is until February 2nd. And it always makes me feel bad when the day after Christmas, everybody throws out their trees. And, you, know, you never really know what happened, huh? So we keep ours and all the decorations up till the 13th, but this year it'll be, I think, Sunday, huh? But we keep them up because that's the season. If you, you want to know the season, that is the season. I also want to wish you all a very, very blessed new year. You know, <clears throat> I think we're all a little bit shaky this year, which I think is a good sign. I think we should all be a little shaky the first of the year. I don't understand some of you who get drunk the first of the year. <laughs> I'd rather be shaky than drunk. Or at least if you're shaky, you know where you're going. But when you're drunk, you have no idea where you're going. You don't even know who you are. I never understood. I never understood New Year's Eve, and you're, you're, you're blowing that horn, but you don't even know why you're blowing it by that time. <laughs> so if I am repentant over all my sins and weaknesses and imperfections, I don't tell me you don't have them. That's nuts. You probably have more than anybody else. But if I'm really sorry for them, then I would really want to be better the next year. That's why, you see, I don't think you're better when you get drunk. I think you made yourself worse the first few moments of the new year. Now, I'm telling you this now in a host about next year. You won't do that. <laughs> Too late for this year. I never understood Mardi Gras. You stuff yourself for three solid days because you're going to fast. Well, I don't think you ought to fast. I think you already messed it up. You got three days of gluttony. You eat, you drink, and you eat anything, and you make yourself look hideous, and you throw things at people. <sighs> if, if you want to prepare for 
the the great season of Lent. It comes early this year. Then why wouldn't you just sit down and and say, I really want to change. I haven't done so good the last few first few months of this year. I really want to change. It's a commercial thing, see. It's all commercial, but you've lost sight, I think, of whatever it is you're supposed to do. You lost sight of that. So, what am I going to talk about tonight? I'm, I'm not really not sure. <laughs> <laughs> And the reason I'm not sure is everybody expects me to speak of New Year's resolutions. But I don't want to talk about something you probably already broke. <laughs> I make the same resolution every year, hoping at some year I'm going to go over that hill. But it doesn't matter, you know. The reason for this season is the newness of it all is to say, I want to be holy. I want to be holy this year. I want to overcome that predominant fault in myself. The one that causes me and everybody around me the most pain. So I thought we would look into scriptures of different kinds of people. These people probably would not make a New Year's resolution. Because I don't think they think they ever do anything wrong. And that's where most of us are today. Now here's one. And see, uh, if you know somebody or maybe you hope you're not one of these. This is not a New Year's resolution, but it's an attitude and he told him a parable. This is a Luke 12, 16. There was once a rich man who, having had a good harvest, thought to himself. Now, here he's thinking to himself. See? It's really a kind of resolution. What am I to do? I have not enough room to store my crops. Well, so far, so good. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, this is what I will do. Now listen to what he's saying. There's no <laughs> generosity here. I will pull down my barns and big, build bigger ones. Uh, if any of you are, live on a farm, past a farm, we have a farm in I mean, if you've ever planted corn, and, you know, our corn don't last too long. The sisters, the brothers eat it, and we give the rest to the cows. <laughs> so there's never any corn. I mean, it's there about two days, and it's gone. Anyway, and then he said, then I'll store all my grain and my goods in them. Well, so far, not too bad. Here is where he begins to fall. He said, and I will say to my soul, my soul have plenty of good things. You have plenty of good things and laid by for many years to come. Now, isn't that something we all think about? Hmm? Some nice lady that I went to school with, I don't have an idea, I don't remember her, but I, I probably should. She sent me a picture of my graduation picture of a, a high school. What do you call those um, books? You, you, huh? Yeah, yearbooks. Oh, you know, I looked at that picture and I thought to myself, if you would have told me then, that I, when I was 75, I'd be doing this now. <laughs> I would have thought you were out of your mind. I was the one voted least likely to succeed. See? And I, 
I looked at that picture and it, something dawned on me. It's been dawning on me a couple of days now. <clears throat> of all the troubles I had and everything else in my lifetime. And sisters asked me the other day, Mother, uh, do you feel that the Lord was training you and leading you and strengthening you for all of this? I said, I don't question that. But you know, while he was going through all that, I would have no idea what God had in mind. I didn't have anything in mind. We were, I was born poor, lived poor, and expected to be poor the rest of my life. Some people are born that way, I thought. But I would have had not had the slightest idea that the Lord was really preparing me to bear all of this. I would have thought you're crazy. But I bet you if you look back tonight, you'll find out that no matter what happened in your entire life up to this moment, God somehow prepared you for something entirely different. I think some of you are saying, yeah, I wish I had married so-and-so. <laughs> well, you didn't marry so-and-so. You married so-and-so. <laughs> so what's... Uh... <laughs> He's the only one that got it, you know? <laughs> All right, that's funny. He's the only one. Okay, I'll try again. <laughs> Is that what you think of him sometimes? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but see, the point is, we don't know in this life what God is preparing for us in this life, let alone the next. I read the life of some saint, I forget who it was. And he was in heaven already. He came down and appeared to another saint and, and said that had he known the glory of heaven and how much glory he received for the least little thing, the least virtue, the least act of kindness, the least act of compassion, goodness, mercy, and all these things, he said he would have been willing to live to the end of time for the merit and the glory of one tiny little act of goodness. Isn't that awesome? But see, we, we not only know what God is preparing for us here, we don't know what God is preparing for us there. If we could even realize that, if we, we can bring it to our mind. Now this man, oh, he was a man of the present moment. <laughs> This happened to be the wrong moment. <laughs> what he says to himself is that take things easy. Eat, drink, and have a good time. Now, isn't that what, what they're telling you today? You know, I'm amazed about designers today. I... Um, I guess they get hard up on, on, they're supposed to sell things say, for the industry, whatever industry it is. If you're talking about clothes or shoes, I see women walking around with heels that big, that big, and that thick. I wanted to measure one the other day, but <laughs> she was walking too fast. I couldn't catch up with her. But the thing that was amazing to me was she's got the same five little toes that she had 10, 20 years ago. See, and all that weight. Well, she wasn't that heavy, but all that weight's on her instep and five little toes. Now, I don't appreciate some foot designer or shoe designer with that kind of design because you say, oh, they're comfortable. Okay, they're comfortable. But God didn't make your foot to be this way. <laughs> he made your foot to be this way. 
and it's a style. Well, if your toes could talk, <laughs> if your toes could talk, they'd say, help, help, help. <laughs> I'm dying. I'm dying. You know, you just wish you were dead. But you see, it's <laughs> you got them on. Oh, Lord, save it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I didn't know you had them on. <laughs> I take it all back. Well, no, I, <laughs> no, I don't take it back. I feel sorry for your toes. <laughs> anyway, what the Lord really said was, so he's got in his mind, you see, that he is definitely going to have a good time. That's what the world tells you today, isn't it? You got to have a good time, man. What's wrong with you? You some kind of square that you're going to stay home on New Year's Eve? Oh, it was often in our place. We had a mass at 11 o'clock. And at 12 o'clock, sister went outside and she rang the big monastic bell. And altogether, she, she uh, rang it four times and she rang it perfect just at the consecration of the bread and the wine. It was just perfect. I thought it was awesome. Awesome. Because we were telling everybody in this neighborhood that he's here, he's coming, he's here. To me, that's New Year's. That's New Year's. Now this man, he has forgotten. He's only thinking of himself. He's going to have a wonderful, wonderful time every day. He's got plenty of uh, produce. And he can just retire now and just have fun. But now, like I've been saying, see, God has something else in mind. He says, thou fool. <coughs> this very night... The demand will be made for your soul. Oh. And for this horde of yours, oh boy. Whose will it be then? <laughs> All you elderly people have a hard time figuring out where do I give my money? To whom? Do you know? I could help you if you call me. <laughs> but you see, we, we say, why well, are you saying we should not prepare for the future? Of course not. You know, in this day and age, you don't even know if you got a future, do you? Did you notice that every time there is a terrible, terrible uh, tragedy, earthquakes and Tsunamis and, and uh, all these uh, storms, blizzards, and everything. Um, well, they all blame God. Have you noticed that? I bet you did too. Why did God allow that? 17,000 people were killed. Well, I always think, why does God allow a billion, 260 million babies aborted ever since 73? Hmm. Kind of strange, don't you think, that we're all excited? The bad part of it is we blame God. And what did the man, that our dear Lord, say to this man? He said, thou fool, this very night the demand will be made for your soul. It is when a man stores up treasures for himself 
instead of making himself rich in the sight of God. Okay, that's what we do at New Year's. Many people, I talked to a man who had made, I think it was 20, 25 million dollars. And I said to him, are you going to retire? He said, oh goodness, no. I said, so what do you want? You can't spend that in your whole lifetime. How old are you? 64. I hate 64. What do you want? I thought he'd offer me a couple. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, he said, I have such a yearning to make 25 more. See, it's just like this man. Thou fool. Am I against wealthy people? Goodness, no. This place wouldn't be here without some of them. Wouldn't be here without you who give faithfully from your Social Security. That isn't the point. It's what's in your heart It's the point. See, there is no reality of God who made you. Why did he make you? Where are you going? How do you get there? And what's it all about? So here's a character here who planned for himself but was never going to get a chance to spend it. Now, here's another one, another type of character that had no reality of eternity or the Lord Yahweh at this point. What does he do? Well, he's a steward. He works for a man who has a, a, a big farm, and he distributes and sells his master's goods. So he looked at this steward and denounced him and said, you are wasteful of my property. He said, what do I hear about you? Draw up an account of your stewardship. You can no longer be steward. No, oh, the steward said to himself, well, now that my master is taking the stewardship from me, see, there is no act of repentance. He's not the least bit sorry that he, did, he stole. He stole from his master. There's no sign here of repentance, none at all. Now, I, I want to ask you, do you see yourself in this man who hoarded and hoarded and hoarded just for himself? Now, here's another man that's doing the same in a different way. My master's taken stewardship from me. What am I to do? Oh, I dig. I am not strong enough. Go begging? I should be ashamed. Ah, I know what I will do to make sure that when I am dismissed from office, there will be some to welcome me in their home. Yeah, that's a terrible, terrible selfishness. You know, some of you men, and I'm not against men, so I'm not a feminist, so you can relax. <laughs> My guard here is making a funny face <laughs> at me. But sometimes, this is true of doctors, lawyers, professional people, scientists, teachers. They, are, they want to provide for their family. Their intention is good, I think. But they work and work and work and work and work and work. They don't know their family, don't see their family, have no relationship with their family. Well, this man isn't even interested in his family. He just wants a place to stay free. Then he called his master's debtors one by one. He said, how much you owe my master? 100 measures of oil, that's a lot of oil. 
He said, here, take your bond and sit down and write 50. It's half. Wouldn't you like your banker call you in? Say, how much you owe this bank? Said, $100,000. Here, sit down here and write 50. Ooh, what would you do? Would you be incensed and say, you're a thief? No, you had written down 50. You say, why? He wanted to give me 50,000, but it wasn't yours. So nobody here is honest. The person who owed 100 and wrote down 50 was just as dishonest as this steward. Now he goes somewhere else. He says, how much do you owe? He's 100 measures of wheat. Hmm. Well, he said, write 80. Not too generous with this one. The master prayed the dishonest steward. Now, he wasn't praising what he did, but he said, this man's smart. He's astute. He said, the children of the world are more astute in dealing with their own kind than the children of light. Do you figure out what you're going to do when you retire? Yeah. I'm going to sleep. <laughs> Why are you going to do that? You're not even conscious when you're sleeping. You don't even know the time of day. I'm going to travel. <gasps> you're going up, uh, up, up steps. You're going up hills that you can't go anymore. You're retired, remember? You're going... <laughs> You can't even go up uh, 20 steps, 30 steps, 50 steps. Mount Gargano, you go up and down 89 steps. You can't do it at your age. Why you spend all that money just to get more tired? I'm exhausted. Well, why don't you go to Venice and just sit in a gondola and just enjoy yourself? Somebody else is rowing. Now that would be a vacation. Climbing a mountain for you? Ooh, forget it. But we're like this man. We're looking for ways for self-pleasure. Now, it's fine if you can do those things. Keep close to the Lord. Remember, hey, I'm in my 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. <laughs> I got to get ready. You know, the old Italian grandfathers, they were scared to death. First, they didn't like, my grandfather did not like me or anybody at the house calling a doctor. He said they didn't know what they were doing and they practiced. They were practicing <laughs> doctors. And he didn't want them to practice on him. Uh, and as priest, oh, he was petrified. Why? Because he thought if a priest walked in the door, he was going to die. That was a sign, the last sacraments. I said, Grandpa, I don't mean the last ones. Yes, it does. It says last. <laughs> that means at this point in your life, I know what it means. It means the last one. I don't want to see them. <laughs> see? So we, we don't have the right idea. If, if I'm getting close to that day when Jesus is going to say, come, your work is over. Well, am I ready? Well, this man was trying to get ready, but not for that kingdom. So now, this man was only thinking of himself and money. And the Lord says here, he said, no, no servant can be slave to two masters. And this is the man who met another man as he was relieved of his stewardship. He was not merciful to him. Because we cannot serve two masters. And that's how we do on New Year's Eve. Christmas Eve, um, 
three days before Lent, last Wednesday. You see, I'm not against parties. I think it's a lot of money for booze. I think it's a lot of waste. But if you were to think for a moment, huh? I'm getting ready to fast for 40 days. Why do I want to be a glutton? Why do I want my senses, my mind, my intellect, my will, so dull that I cannot make a decision. Why do we do that? Why do we want to? Hmm? Well, apparently, apparently, you and I are not thinking. <coughs> I'm going to have to take a break because that old asthma is acted up. And I'll be back in just a minute. Well, thank you for waiting. You know, we were talking about how we serve two masses, but you can't. We want to, we want to do all the pleasurable things we can do, and then then we want to be good. See, before Lent, we want to do all the sinful things we can think of, and then we'll fast. Well, if I know that sin, especially mortal sin separates me from God, it wouldn't make any sense to say I'm going to start Lent separating myself from God. Does that make any sense? Does it make sense to say I'm so sorry for all the sins I committed all this last year? I want to make reparation. I want to do better, God. So I'm going to get drunk. <laughs> Does that make any sense? I don't, I don't think we know what we're doing. I think you better go to confession on Ash Wednesday because you already blew the whole thing. See, when we say I want to be like Jesus, I don't know what you mean, but what we should mean is I want to act like him according to my capacity. If a little child saw its father running, it would want to run, and it would. Well, it couldn't possibly do as well, but it's running. It's an imitation thing, see? I'm imitating. Jesus. It's not in an infinite way. I can't. But in my way. I want to be like him. Well, Jesus would not get drunk like that, see? It's the world. And, and some people black out. They don't have the slightest idea what they did. So we can't have two minds and, and kind of match them. See? Some of you kids want to try before you buy, you know. So you live together a couple of years, and then you decide, no, nah, this is not the one. Well, what did you gain? You offended God. You, you ruined your own soul. See, we, we don't think. We say, well, a lot of people getting the divorce. Where well, you're, 
You're one going to get one. See, you, there's no reality of an existing God who gives me grace to, to act like him. And if I, if I don't know that, then I'm just going to squander my life like the man who had all of this produce. He was going to enjoy himself, and the Lord said, no, no. You're going to be called tonight. Now what? Think of yourself, now what? I am going to be before God with nothing to offer him. All was for me. So, in case you made that kind of resolution, it's not too late. It's a new day, a new night tonight. You can resolve and will. I am not going to offend God this year. Not willfully. I may lose my temper, I may do this or that, but I will not willfully offend God. You know, we, the brothers brought us some tapes for Christmas, and we got one of the tsunami, these big waves. We got one on earthquakes, and we got one. It was very interesting. I kind of enjoy these kind of movies. And then we had one on tornadoes and one on, uh, what were they, volcanoes. Oof. I know the same thing happened in that movie on the volcano. There's a famous scientist and his wife and 45 people who had the knowledge, I tell you, they knew everything about a volcano next to God. And they went to see this volcano and this little just graduated from weather school, whatever you call these, meteorologists. And uh, he went up to this famous scientist and he said, Doctor, I, I would go that direction if I were you. And this doctor said, are you telling me what to do? He said, no, I'm just saying I would go. He said, it's going to blow. He said, I can tell you from my 35 years experience, it is not going to blow. Okay. The sad thing was that he and 45 people in this, these red trucks went right where the young man told him not to go. And that whole mountain blew apart and covered them with ash. See, we don't always know the best thing to do. And that's obvious the way we act that we do more against ourselves than for ourselves. And then we say, I had a good time. It takes you two days to wake up. <laughs> two days before you get your wits together. They have to give you coffee. They have to... I mean, for you, you, you put yourself in some kind of whatever for two solid days. Okay. Now, tell me why you would do that to yourself. Okay. And say, oh, I love God. <laughs> oh, come on, don't tell me that. You don't even know God, let alone love Him. Oh, you wife abusers, you, your wife goes into a hospital, she's got a black eye, her arm is broke, and you say you love her? That's a strange kind of love. That's not love at all. You are a bully, and you get joy out of beating your wife. Oh, that's so uh, terrible. It's small on your part, it's cheap on your part, and you wouldn't do that to someone equal to you. You do it because your wife is helpless. See? You don't think. How, do, how would it be at that moment you would drop dead and face God? 
Oh, can you imagine in that frame of mind? Oh. Hmm? And the reason, you know, for a lot of this is that you, I never quite understood. The abused become abusers. I never understood that. I know a psychologist, a psychiatrist, could, but on a human level, on a level of just common sense, if you were beaten up by a father, why do you want to beat up your children? Are you getting even with innocent people? See, we, we, we're doing things today that are not human. Not human. Because animals don't even do that. Animals don't always act like we do. So I would, I think, if you want to make a resolution for New Year's, I would stop tomorrow and give yourself a half hour somewhere on the park bench, but well, it's too cold, someplace. <laughs> you know, we saw a, new, a movie on Scrooge during the Christmas season, and instead of going into hot hell, he went into cold hell. Scrooge did. I thought it was kind of clever. Because the whole thing was that he was so cold to his neighbor, so selfish, self-oriented, that his place in hell was freezing cold. I know it isn't that way there, but still, it was a good concept. So why, when you have so little time on this earth to change, to be transformed, to love, to be like Jesus? to be like God, where you want to wreck your own life, huh? And then take the risk of doing something else forever. <clears throat> mm. Well, we have a call. Hello? Hello, Mother. Hi. This is Bernard from Pittsburgh. Where are you? I'm in, I'm in Pittsburgh. You're out there? Yes. Hello? Somewhere, huh? Hello? Ah. Can you hear me? Hear you. you can hear me. Somebody pulled the wrong button. <laughs> uh, okay, does we, oh, we know his question. Okay, his question's about how do I know what? Oh, suffering has value. What do you know? We know it because of Jesus. Yeah. You know, this is my profession cross. Beautiful. It's uh, ebony and brass. I know suffering has value because of him. Because if he had to go through this to save me, and then it's worth it. See? It's all worth it. Because he suffered for my salvation, for my redemption, that I would have the Eucharist, that I would have the Mass. I mean, there's so many sacraments. Um, you see, a lot of us think that suffering is an evil. No, it's a good. Because then I'm like Jesus. Some of you don't realize I keep telling my sisters at lesson. Dryness, what's dryness? Dryness is, is uh, when you go to pray and you don't feel like praying and you're kind of bored and then you read and you're bored reading and you look out the window and there's nobody there and you do all these things, see? What are you doing? You're running away from suffering. And why does God allow that? He wants you to love with a pure love. See, everybody here, everybody there wants to be loved with a pure love. You don't want anybody that has to love you, is forced to love you. No. So if you don't feel consolation from God, that's a good sign. Oh, I don't like your signs. Well, you got any other? You got something other you want to share? 
consolations are from God. It's like going through the desert and you get a little oasis, huh? But you got to persevere. You know, if, if the Son of God had to go through all of this, how come you think you can go from heaven to heaven? Hmm? You know what our Lord said to poor Adam? From now on, you will plant and you will reap weeds. Mm. Apparently, he planted before and reaped a lot of fruit. You must f persevere in loneliness, in desolation, in, in your, your problems. And they all pass. They all pass, you know. And you can say, oh, God's not hearing me. Hey, he's the only one that does. <laughs> God hears you. He just said no. This man was an atheist and his little daughter wanted a bicycle for Christmas. And he purposely didn't buy it for her. So she ran down thinking she's going to have the bicycle and it wasn't there. He said, see, I told you God wouldn't give you that bicycle. He didn't answer your prayer. He said, oh, yes, he did. I said, no, he didn't. Yeah, he said no. <laughs> see, for a small child, he said no. She got an answer. Now, if you say, well, I need assurance that God loves me, you got to be kidding. You wouldn't be here if he didn't love you. He chose you to be from all eternity, before time began. He chose you by name, by looks, by temperament, by place, by the certain age you're there. He chose you before time began. And you're saying he doesn't love you? Did the father love his son when he was like this? Did he? Of course he did. His son was redeeming all of mankind. Say, well, it doesn't feel good. Do you think this felt good? Do you think being so torn apart and crucified that he felt good? No. What we're doing, huh, is trying to imitate Jesus. Well, he didn't feel good. He suffered terrible. And even during his lifetime, He said, birds of the air have nets and foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Don't you think that was suffering? Don't you think after thousands of years you decided to come and there's no more to greet you? <laughs> Do you, do you ever think of going and visit somebody and you look forward to it? Oh, and you do your best and you wait and wait and wait and you finally get there and nobody even says, hi, hi. How would you feel? See? Well, all of that he did just for you. I'm going to say a little prayer for you. I only have a few seconds. I just want to say, Lord Jesus, please. Give all of these people who have helped us, who love us, and whom we love many graces this year. Most of all, the grace to want to be holy, want to be good, want to be like Jesus. That's what we want, Lord. We could have many things, but if we don't have that, we have nothing. And so, Lord, bless us all tonight with thy peace, thy grace, thy joy. Amen. God bless you all.